Hey, before we um, come to God's word, let's spend some time in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you thanks. We thank you for this place in which to gather. We thank you for a nation in which to have the freedom to worship you openly. And Father, we pray that we would take full advantage of that freedom by proclaiming the glories of grace through faith in Jesus. Father, I pray that as your word is open this morning, as it's read, and as we speak and hear from you, I pray that you would touch hearts, that you would transform lives, that you would win the lost and build believers, that workers would be equipped for the harvest, and that we would have the privilege of sending disciple makers into the world, so that, Father, we could see in this county a great harvest to the praise of your glorious grace. Oh, how much we need you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. So in my early 20s, a group of uh, my friends and I, we, we took a job to uh, drive a fleet of vehicles across the country. So we drove from North Carolina to California in this fleet of vehicles, and we had a great plan. The plan was we would take turns, some of us would sleep and some of us would drive, and we were going to drive straight through from North Carolina to California. It was the middle of the night, in the midst of our trip, and we stopped at a a truck stop. It must have been two in the morning. We stop at this truck stop. Everybody runs in. We get our coffee, we use the restroom, we buy some snacks, and I came out. And the whole fleet of vehicles was gone. And I was stranded, alone, at a truck stop at 2 o'clock in the morning. No cell phones back then. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. But I had hope. I had confidence that my friends, they would come back for me. And after about two hours, one of the vehicles pulled in. And my friend, Chad, with great apologies, said, I'm so sorry, Dave, we forgot you, but we didn't leave you. I was so glad to not be stranded at that truck stop. But what if it was something a little less, or a little more tragic, a little more impactful than being left at a truck stop in the middle of the night? So many of us have experienced being stranded. Friends who have betrayed us, spouses who have left us, it's absolutely heartbreaking to be stranded. And I have good news for you this morning. Jesus will not leave us stranded. You feel alone in this world. Jesus will not leave you stranded. In our world with COVID and division and rioting and fighting and anger, Jesus hasn't given up. Jesus will not leave you stranded. I have good news this morning that God has a plan and he is accomplishing his purposes in the world today and he's doing it as people grab hold of the truth of the gospel, grab hold of the love of Christ and are gripped by the truth that Jesus will not leave us stranded. So I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to pick back up in verse 23 and keep going through chapter 3, verse 12. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Jesus won't leave us stranded. In between verse 22 and verse 23, 40 years goes by. You say, well, God, what were you doing? What was happening in Israel? What was happening in the lives of the people of Israel in Egypt was this. They were trusting God. 
They were believing the promises of God. They were multiplying in the land of Egypt. They were having children. And every child that was born, they remembered the way God had moved in their midst to spare their children from the wrath of Pharaoh. Every time a child was born, that child was circumcised. The male children were circumcised as a reminder that God was true to his promises. Every child heard the gospel and every child proclaimed the gospel of hope that God wouldn't forget them. And they continued to pray and trust God that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would remember his promise. And he had told Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 13, he had told Abraham ahead of time that his people would go down into a foreign land and they would be oppressed and afflicted for 400 years, but God would remember. He wouldn't leave them stranded and he would bring them up. And so every generation, every generation from Jacob until now remembered that promise and they were faithful to God and they cried out to God in prayer and they continued to trust the promises of the gospel. When trusting the promises of the gospel is hard, don't forget Jesus will not leave us stranded. Now he shows up in the life of Moses in chapter 3. Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So God appears in a burning bush, a bush that is burning with fire, fire, a picture of the holy, holy, holy God, a picture of God's presence abiding in this place with fire, and this fire does not consume the bush. You say, could that be? Listen, the most important verse in the Bible is the first verse. And the first verse of the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And once I settled that fact in my heart and mind, then every other verse, burning bushes, parted seas, manna from heaven, every other verse becomes possible because the God who made all things is free to work in the way He chooses to work. He is holy, holy, holy. Holy, and if he chooses to reveal his glory in a bush that's not consumed in the midst of fire, he is free to do it. He is the creator, he's over all things. Why is this bush not consumed? The bush is not consumed because the bush isn't in rebellion against the holy God. The bush isn't consumed because the bush has done no harm to the glory of God. But Moses, Moses, to draw near to the flaming holiness of God, places himself in danger. And God says, Moses, Moses, don't come near. My holiness will consume you. Because unlike the bush, you are in rebellion against me. You're filled with sin. You were born in sin and you are in rebellion. Just like me. Just like all of us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so God, to reveal himself in his holy fire, places us in danger. And were it not for the fact that God in his grace cries out, Moses, Moses, 
You've heard that formula before. We've heard God call out to a person using their name twice. You heard it in the book of Genesis. When God appears to Abraham, having called him to go to a mountain and there sacrifice his son Isaac, Abraham in obedience raises his knife and is about to sacrifice his son Isaac. And God calls out to Abraham and he says, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. And now again, God calls out to Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. God, in his grace, calls out to you. And he calls out to me. And he says, your name. And he calls and he, he longs for you in faith to say, yes, here I am. That God in his grace and mercy has provided a way for sinners like me and sinners like Moses and sinners like you to have a place of refuge in the midst of holy ground. He has provided a way of shelter in the, so that his holiness doesn't consume us. He's provided a place of escape in his son, Jesus Christ. That in Jesus, God can be holy, holy, holy. And though we are sinners and deserve his wrath, he does not destroy us for the sake of Jesus and Jesus alone. That's the gospel. The gospel is so simple. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. The gospel invites us to come and sit with God in holy ground. The gospel says you can be accepted by God. That his holiness doesn't destroy you because Christ has taken your place. The gospel tells us that our part is to believe. God gives Moses a simple command. Take off your shoes. Take off your shoes and God gives us a simple command. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You say it's too easy. If people believe this simple gospel, they'll go and do whatever they want. They'll run amok. They'll take advantage of your grace. God, they'll take advantage of your love. But if you see in God a holy, holy, holy fire who has given his son to provide a refuge for sinful humanity that God doesn't set aside his holiness but he accepts sinners through the grace of his son that God made him Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God that God provides for us a place of escape. He causes the Holy One, Jesus, to be punished in our place. God takes all of our sin and places it on Jesus on the cross and he pours out his wrath on Jesus in our place. The holy fire of God's amazing holiness is placed on Jesus. And then Jesus takes his righteousness. And to all who believe, he offers his righteousness so that we can sit in the presence of God without fear. Here I am. Have you ever said it? Are you willing to say it today? To the holy God who made you and formed you and fashioned you and does not want to consume you. Are you willing to say, here I am, here I am, here I am? Verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. I am aware of their sufferings, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, 
to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hittite, Hivite and the Jebusite. Behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. The present condition of Israel in Egypt is bad. We've looked at it several times as we've walked through Exodus just in these first three weeks. We've seen that they were oppressed, afflicted. They are hurting. And isn't it true of our world today that so many people are hurting? And if I could take time this morning to listen to your hearts, your hearts, so many of your hearts are hurting and broken. We're confused. We're angry. We're doubting. We're hesitant. God sees, and Jesus has not left us stranded. God is going to take upon himself the initiative to go and deliver his people. I will come down and deliver my people. God isn't dependent upon Moses. He's going to invite Moses to be a part of going and leading. But God says, I will take the initiative. I will do this work. I will come and seek and save my people. I will lead them up. Our world is broken. It's devastated by sin and the fall. Our lives are broken and devastated by sin and the fall. But our God has taken upon himself and himself alone the responsibility of rescue, the responsibility of deliverance, the responsibility of restoring all things. God has done it. He's not waiting for us. He has taken the initiative. And God, through his deliverance, is going to bring about a complete reversal. A complete reversal. Everything that is broken will one day be made right. The division between us and God is going to be reconciled and is reconciled through Jesus Christ. God is going to bring about a complete reversal. He's going to bring deliverance from the hand of Egypt to a land, the land of promise. He's going to restore good in place of affliction. He's going to replace bondage with a spacious land. And our God, our God is going to take and instead of there being bitterness and suffering, there's going to be a land of milk and honey. Instead of suffering, an amazing, wonderful provision by our God. A complete reversal. Everything broken and sad made right. You say, but Dave, there's still so much in my life that's broken. I know, mine too. Still so much broken, but listen, we experience this reversal. We experience it in three stages. Now we're experiencing the reversal through Jesus Christ. Jesus will not leave us stranded. He says, I'm going to be with you, and I've given you the Holy Spirit, and I've given you the Word of God, and I've given you the church, and I've given you biblical community so that you can experience my love now. You're not alone. Jesus said, I'll be with you always. You're not alone. Now we experience the brokenness, but the good, the beauty, the grace of our God who is with us. The next step in this process of a complete reversal happens at death. And at death, our souls go immediately to be with God. And that's better because now we're with God, but There's still one more step. The best is yet to come. That the final complete reversal will happen when Jesus comes again to establish the final state of things and everything sad will come untrue and there will be a perfect earth, a restored creation. God in the midst of his people on a perfect earth, an earth that will flow with milk and honey without sin, without stain, without brokenness, without the curse, and God will be with his people forever. 
Don't miss it. Don't miss it. And the greatest thing, the greatest thing about that new earth is that Jesus will be there. And Jesus will bear his scars, and for all of eternity, we will have the opportunity to say to Jesus, our Savior, thank you, thank you, thank you for this great deliverance. You didn't leave us stranded. You came again for us. You never let us down in this earth. You were with us all the way to the end. Thank you. Thank you. Everything sad has come untrue. What about us now? What about Moses? Verse 10, Therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? He said, Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. We've established the fact that God is holy and that we are not. That God is holy, but in his grace, he's provided a way of escape. He's provided a salvation so that we have a place to rest in his presence despite our sin. He doesn't destroy us in his holiness. He gives us grace to be with him. We've established the fact that Jesus saves and that he is going to take upon himself. God has taken upon himself the deliverance that we need and that the best is yet to come that one day... Everything sad really will come untrue. But what about us now? Jesus won't leave us stranded now. Jesus won't leave Moses stranded now. He's not going to leave Moses on the backside of nowhere in the middle of a wilderness by himself with a group of sheep. And he's not going to leave you. But he invites you. He invites you to the greatest Endeavor ever. Moses, Moses, I know 40 years later you still feel the sting of your failure. I know you still remember your failure with the Egyptian back in Egypt that you killed and hid in the sand. Your failures aren't fatal. I still have a plan for you. And the first time you stood up for Jesus and you tried to share your faith and you felt like a complete failure, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you. Your failures aren't fatal. Your present isn't futile. Your life now is not a waste. Don't waste your life. Know that Jesus is with you. He hasn't left you stranded. I will be with you. God promises to Moses, I'll be with you. Your life now, it isn't futile. It has a purpose. But don't miss this. Moses receives the presence of God first. Then he receives the assurance from God that God will take upon himself this great project of salvation for his people. And then he invites him into that plan. Identity and then purpose. If you make your purpose, if you make your work of ministry, if you make anything other than what God has done for you in Jesus, your greatest source of hope, your greatest source of significance, you'll lose. But if you learn to sit in the presence of God if you learn to abide in Christ, if you learn who Jesus says you are, and then from that place of God's presence, then you move out into the harvest. Then you'll be sustained by grace, renewal in us, and then ministry from us. First our identity as sons and daughters of God, then our purpose. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. That's who you are. 
You're a new creation. You're in Christ. You have a place to sit in the presence of a holy God and not be consumed. You're a new creation. But because of who you are in Christ now, verse 20, he's made you to be an ambassador. To go and proclaim the glory of Jesus and the salvation that he has brought to the world. Don't miss it. Don't miss the opportunity of a lifetime to be a part of what God is doing in the world. Don't miss it. God is holy. Jesus has made a way for us to enter into a forever relationship with this holy God. God has taken upon himself the responsibility for this salvation. He has done it. He is doing it. Our part is to trust, believe, live out of our identity. And to go on holding on to Jesus. We hold on to Jesus. We hold on to Jesus for salvation. I will come down and I will deliver. Are you aware of what God has done to redeem you, save you, forgive you, give you righteousness, give you an identity, give you a place to sit in the presence of God? Are you aware? Today, as you sit here, what is the present value for you today of the work of Jesus Christ. It is not something to just sniff at and to leave behind. It's not something to say, oh, well, I, yeah, I get that. I understand the gospel. Yes, Jesus, he forgave me. I'm going to go be with him in heaven. No, what is the present value of what Jesus has done for you today? Moses met the living God. Moses experienced the present value of Jesus in the wilderness. Moses experienced salvation, not just when he was rescued from a basket in the Nile. He experienced the grace of God at age 80 in the midst of of seeing a bush that was burning and not consumed. Are you willing to believe the gospel for you today? Are you willing, Christian, to say, yes, I still need the present value of Jesus. I still need Christ, my shelter from the burning holiness of God. I need Jesus today. Not just 20 years ago when I trusted Christ. I need him today. And if you'll take that, if you'll take Jesus into your life today, you will experience the renewal that comes from the gospel and you'll be sent out on mission with the gospel. Jesus invites us, I will send you. Jesus spoke to his disciples. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Jesus says the same thing to his disciples that God says to Moses. He says the same thing to you today. Are you willing to follow Jesus in the mission he has left for the church? Are you willing to follow Jesus in the mission? You need Jesus, the present value of the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy, the righteousness of Jesus. You need it. And when it moves into your life, it sends you out. The word mission comes from the Latin word missi. It means sent. You're sent. You're sent at the command of Jesus. Every bit as much as Moses was sent by the command of God, you and I are sent at the command of Jesus into the world. We're missionaries. It's not about what you can come and do for the church. It's about how the church can be sent into the world. We're not waiting around, waiting for you to jump in. We're waiting for you to say yes to being sent to being sent in the name of Jesus as his ambassadors, his missionaries, to your neighborhood, to your workplace, to your school, to your team, 
Because who else will go? Who else will go? If we don't say, here I am, we will miss the joy, the privilege, the honor, the glory of being his sent ones. Don't miss it. We hold on to Jesus for salvation. We hold on to Jesus for mission. We hold on to Jesus for power. You say, I can't do it. I, 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 can't, I can't drop the J-bomb with my team. I, I can't talk about Jesus at my office. You, you don't understand. My, my commissions will go down. Are you willing to trust the God who burns but a bush isn't consumed? Are you willing to trust a God who can deliver two million people on his own? Are you willing to trust a God that's greater than all the gods of Egypt? Are you willing to trust a God who says, I will be with you? Jesus promised his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. How is it that we can hold on to Jesus? We hold on to Jesus as we tell others of him. I pray that you might be active in sharing your faith, that you might know everything you have in Christ. The more we tell others of him, the more real he becomes in our life. The more we tell others of him, the more we worship him. We trust him for salvation. We trust him. We hold on to him for mission. We hold on to him for power. We hold on to him for hope. Solitary Moses is given a promise that the next time he is at the foot of this mountain, he will not be alone. When you... This shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you, singular, have brought the people out of Egypt, y'all shall worship God at this mountain. The promise is this. When we step out in mission, we don't go alone. God is with us and we don't return alone. And the why is that when you come back to this place, when you, Moses, come back to this mountain, the why is worship. The why is the praise of God. Don't miss that. What's your why? Is your why, why power? That was the Egyptians' why. It was not a big enough why to withstand the glory of God who moved into their land. Is your why success? That was Moses' initial why, but it wasn't enough. He needed a bigger why. And the bigger why that God gave him at the mountain in Oreb alone was that God was going to be glorified by bringing his people back to worship him. The why of mission, the why of of ministry, the why of the church, the why of your life is the glory of God in all things. Why? Because we long to see God worshipped. John Piper has said, missions exist because worship doesn't. We long to see God worshipped amongst every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We long to see from midnight to midnight, the praise and worship and glory of Jesus. We love to gather in our time zone, in our zip code, to worship Jesus because that's our why, that Jesus would be a big deal and that we would offer all of our lives all for Jesus. That why is enough to move us to do whatever it takes for as many as possible to be gathered together in worship of Jesus. Not to have a big church, but to have a people to praise our Savior. Jesus is worthy. 
And he has not left us stranded. We feel it at times. One of my heroes is Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor at one time in his life felt stranded. And then he met God at a beach in Brighton. On Sunday, June 25th, 1865, unable to bear the sight of a congregation of a thousand or more Christian people rejoicing in their own security while millions were perishing for lack of knowledge, I wandered out on the sands alone in great spiritual agony. And there the Lord conquered my unbelief and I surrendered myself to God for his service. I told him, that all the responsibility as to the issues and consequences must rest with him, that as his servant, it was mine to obey and to follow him, his to direct, to care for, and to guide me and those who might labor with me. Need I say that peace that it once flowed into my burdened heart? There and then I asked him for 24 fellow workers, two for each of 11 inland provinces which were without a missionary, and two for Mongolia. And writing the petition on the margin of the Bible I had with me, I returned home with a heart enjoying rest such as it had not been a stranger to for months. Oh, that this would be your beach, that this would be your wilderness in Horeb, That this would be a time and a place when God the Holy Spirit would show you the holiness of God and your need for Jesus' grace. When God the Holy Spirit would move into your heart to help you see the wonders of what God has done for you in Jesus. That the glory of that salvation would then move you out into mission, depending wholly, completely, solely, holding on to Jesus, for he alone is able to sustain us in that mission. He alone is able to give us the power. Father, give us that power. And that, oh, we would have a why. The glory of God that Jesus would be our all. He won't leave you stranded. He won't. He'll be with you all the way home. Hold on, hold on to Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are our all in all. Thank you that you haven't left us alone. Thank you that you haven't left us stranded. Jesus, would you come and minister to every heart in this room and all those gathered online? You're not limited. You're with us. You've promised your Holy Spirit. Would you speak to our hearts now? Would you show us that you're real? Jesus, would you work in the hearts of any here this morning who who aren't yet in Christ, who are still looking to anything other than Jesus for a refuge from your holiness. Jesus, I pray that you would work and that they would say to you, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you in many ways. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. Forgive me of all my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. Come into my life as Savior and Lord and help me become the person you want me to be. And oh, for all of us, may we hold on to you, Jesus, and may you get us safely home. We pray in your name. Amen. Will you stand as we